with COVID vaccines dominating the headlines at the moment, and we're being told that they're looking great in terms of efficacy, we thought who better to speak to than a Emmy award-winning producer, Del Bigtree, and also host of The High Wire. Welcome back to the program. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here, Natalie. Now, we've got a lot of information to get through in a very short amount of time. So, first of all, I wanted to start with uh, the COVID vaccine is obviously being compared to a lot of other vaccines that are around and available uh, to us already, especially the flu vaccine. So the flu vaccine generally has, according to reports that we've read, 40 to 60% efficacy, but we're being told that the new COVID vaccines are at around 90 to 95% effective. Is this possible in a vaccine to have that sort of efficacy? Well, certainly, uh, I suppose it's possible. Anything's possible. I, I believe in science and you know, I know that good science can be done and we can always strive for better. But there's already a lot of confusion about the statements that you just made. Number one, you cannot compare this vaccine to a flu vaccine because these are brand new experimental technologies. Never before in the history of mankind have we injected a product that's about to do what these vaccines do. In the one hand, you have the mRNA vaccine approach, which is being used by Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, this is not, now remember, every vaccine up until this point has in some way or another injected a small particle of a virus into your body to put in adjuvants to sort of hyper stimulate your immune system so that it recognizes that the virus is there, whether it's a killed virus or a live virus, but it creates antibodies to fight that virus. Uh, we, so that's how really, in, in being very general, how most vaccines have always worked. These new technologies are now working with our DNA and our RNA. And in case of the mRNA vaccine, we are turning your body not only into a vaccine ma uh, manufacturer, but a virus manufacturer. This mRNA message that's in the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine is being sent into your body. Now, an RNA message tends to be your DNA sends an RNA message to give advice or uh, tell your cells what to do in your body. And so that's how, you know, your body works. This is a fake RNA message that didn't come from your DNA. And what the RNA message is, is telling your cells to build the COVID-19 or SARS coronavirus 2 spike protein. So you're telling your cells to make the virus. And then after your body has produced the virus in its own factory, Hopefully, the idea is that then your body will recognize, oh, my God, there's all of a sudden a virus here and start creating the antibodies and the T cell immunity to fight it. So it's a brand new, very, very experimental approach uh, where the virus is creating the body. So I just want to point out, and then the other one's an adenovirus vector vaccine, sort of similar. We make a, we take a monkey uh, uh, adenovirus that your body doesn't really recognize, supposedly, and we put a message inside of that, a fragment um, that's going to encode in your DNA, and we send that into your body. Either way, I just want people to know this is totally experimental. None of these companies have ever had an ex a success with this process, even though they've been working on them for 10 to 20 years. It's all been a failure until suddenly now it's not a failure. Um, so you can't compare this vaccine to how vaccines have always been made. What we are comparing is the coronavirus to the flu. And the reason that comparison is being made is unlike measles or other more stable illnesses where we imagined you could, you know, we know when you caught measles as a child, you would have lifelong immunity because your body recognizes so totally the measles virus that it will never in any form, it won't mutate enough to, you know, to trick your immune system and get past it. Whereas the flu mutates all the time, many, many times every year. We're trying to guess what new mutation or what version is coming our way. And that's what the coronavirus is like. It is constantly mutating. Many discussions that it's already potentially mutated over 100, some say as many as 400 times 
there's been mutations of the coronavirus, but we get new versions of coronavirus, coronaviruses, flu viruses every year, which is why they've never really been able to achieve that herd immunity, which would be a vaccine uh, that makes you, is, protects you from flu your whole life. Or even when you catch a flu, it doesn't necessarily protect you for your entire life. It protects you for many, many years. And then eventually there'll be a mutation that your body doesn't recognize and you'll have to catch it again. So that's where that comparison is coming in. It's, it's actually between the similarity in the way the viruses work, not the similarity of the vaccine. So uh, one of the main questions that I found or came across when I was going through all the different feeds online is that the mRNA vaccine, because it is dealing with your DNA, that it will forever alter the DNA of the person who has that vaccine. Is that a correct statement? Um, it's not a correct statement as a fact. It is a theoretical possibility. Um, and that's why you want to do long-term studies on this. Remember, we have a message that's telling your cells to create a spike protein. The question that really has not been answered is what if your cells just keep making uh, COVID-19 spike protein the rest of your life? Uh, what would stop that process? Now, there's an assumption that it will stop fairly immediately once the antibodies come along, but we really don't know. We don't know that we have it. It's, it's very much like you know, when we were going to drop the first atom bomb or split atoms for the first time, the real concern was what if the atoms never stopped splitting? It would eventually just wipe out all existence on the earth. And so science took the risk to try it out. Um, very much what's happening inside of those trial, the people involved in these trials, we really don't know what's happening in their immune system right now. We know that they got sick after the first shot, but didn't really create the correct antibodies to stop the illness. But after the second shot, when they get sick, it seems to be creating the, um, the, the more important antibodies, the, the ones, so the neutralizing antibodies are involved. Now, what we don't know is, has the process stopped happening in their body? Did the RNA stop sending this message or have the cells then corrected all of these, and, and, we're, and I'm really generalizing, we are, cre we are starting a factory up and making it run. We're creating a factory that's never happened in the immune system. Who shuts that down? When does the body shut it down? We won't have answers to that for three, five, 10 years down the road, watching these people that were involved in the trial. The concern is that as soon as this vaccine gets approved, science will stop watching and looking for the answer for the long-term effects. And this is why it's so dangerous to have uh, protection from liability, which has been granted in virtually every country around the world. I think Brazil might be pushing back on this, but in every country, for the most part, for getting liability to manufacturing them from liability. So, and as AstraZeneca said in an article, I believe it was the Daily Mail, um, they said, we have to be protected from liability because we can't be held responsible if there's an adverse event that appears four years down the road because we all rushed this vaccine out for the politicians and for this great fear in the WHO. Since you made us rush the safety process, we didn't do it long enough. Therefore, we can't be held responsible for the long-term adverse events that could lead to death that we were unable to you know, see or understand because our trials didn't last long enough. That's what's going on right now. So this emergency use authorization is essentially putting this, it, it, it's almost like you're dying of cancer and you want to try a trial drug. It's sort of that right to uh, try, right? We've talked about this concept around the world. That's what's happening. The world is being given a right to try a product that is still in the middle of very important safety trials and have, hasn't gotten through it. That's why it's so shocking to see the media pushing and having some scientists, not all, a lot are really warning people, but most of media is, is ramping people up and only telling them about this 95% effect efficacy or 100% efficacy, not talking about the complete and total lack of understanding of the overall safety profile of this, these vaccines, which could end up being the most deadly vaccines ever made, or it might be the safest vaccine ever made. The point is, is we have not done the science that would give us those answers, and we won't have it for several years. So one of the things that I, I'm not sure, I think this is correct, 
because all of this is being rolled out under uh, the PREP Act here in the US, there is a uh, vaccine injury and death um, fund essentially that people get payouts for if they are injured uh, by vaccines. And it doesn't come from the manufacturers, it does come from the government. But because this is all being done under the PREP Act, there will be no compensation if people are injured or die from this vaccine. Is that correct? I don't know that that's correct. In fact, okay. we are still trying to analyze the PREP Act. There are concerns that it is taking this court system, which is a really flawed court system that exists under the 1986 Vaccine Injury Compensation Act, where we already did liability protection for all the childhood vaccines that are being given to our children. The PREP Act now protects any, remember it's not just vaccines, it's really any medical practice whatsoever that's being used in an emergency. It's so broad, in fact, that I think you could argue in court that a doctor that just decided to shoot you and said that was the best op you know, option I thought I had the time to handle COVID-19, you might get away with it because it is so broad in saying anything a doctor does or anything a drug company does to attempt to try and help you in an emergency with a new disease is, is not, you cannot sue them for it. So it's extremely broad, but where will the payouts come from for those that are injured by this vaccine. Remember, when you take liability away, it doesn't just disappear. Most of the time, what happens is the government now becomes responsible to pay you instead of the manufacturer. I wanna correct one thing. The government is not what's paying you in vaccine court in the United States of America under the 1986 compensation program. The taxpayer is. You are paying a tax on every vaccine that's going into a bank account that pays those that are injured. So we pay for the injury, not the manufacturer. It's a good question, is the PREP Act, there's a lot of talk that they're going to have to set up another fund under the PREP Act like they're using in the 1986 uh, Act. Okay, so I'm going to ask one last question um, before we wrap up part one. The, you were talking about side effects and um, the long-term effects. In all the literature I was reading uh, over the last few days, every article said that most vaccine uh, reactions or adverse reactions happen within the six week period from the initial injection. But when I was reading it, one of my questions was, what about cancers, leukemias and things like that, which have in the past been linked to vaccines, I mean, is it possible for them to, to really know any of this sort of quite quickly? Well, let's be clear. That's one of the, my investigation and what puts me into the position I am been in is a five year investigation into how they've determined that vaccines are safe at all. And what, you, what you're pointing to is one of the great problems with the science, the science around vaccines. They have avoided doing long-term studies on virtually every vaccine so that what they'll tell you is we don't, there is no proof that a vaccine causes a, you know, multiple sclerosis or cancer or leukemia or all these things that are all the autoimmune disease, which is on an incredible rise. At the same time, we're increasing the amount of vaccines. Most vaccine trials, and this is something that we're directly, we've sued the FDA, we have petitioned the FDA, and I think our nonprofit, Informed Consent Action Network, is actually having an effect on these trials. We demanded our nonprofit, because we've won lawsuits against the FDA now, they listen to us, we demanded that they add a saline placebo group in the phase three trials of every vaccine that's gonna be approved, the COVID-19 vaccines in America, and that we said we would publicly denounce any statements about safety if they did not use a saline placebo. This is something that they haven't really done when approving all the other vaccines. Well, guess what? Two days later, every newspaper article said, we're stopping down phase three trials for a reassessment. And then five days later, they added the placebo control arm to every American phase three trial of a COVID-19 vaccine. We believe we've directly affected that. We also are petitioning that there be long, that no matter what, even after emergency use authorization, that these trials last at least two to three years so that we can see, are they causing 
future um, autoimmune disease or cancers. Remember, every drug we take essentially has gone through that process. We know to follow drug, you know, uh, pharmaceutical drug use in clinical trials that tend to last three to five years, sometimes like grandpa's Viagra was a 10 year safety trial for that very reason. They know there may be long-term cancer that could be caused, long-term autoimmune issues. And so we run a placebo group getting a saline, either a saline injection if it's an injectable product or a sugar pill if it's a uh, uh, pill and therefore no one knows who they're getting and we track the health of both groups for five to ten years we want the same thing to happen with vaccines but it's not currently most vaccines you're lucky if the trial lasted six months right now this covid19 vaccine is technically about two months three months max into its phase three safety trial uh not nearly enough time so yes Scientists will tell you that the major problems are in the six weeks, but that's because most of their trials only last six weeks. You see, this is the languaging and this is the gimmick with how they're getting away with really bad safety science when it comes to vaccines. Del, that is a perfect place to leave it. We are going to be right back with part two.